but I want to introduce our next speaker who can talk about ways that you can partner with nonprofits, and that is Jim Kleinwalter, who is the Conservation at Home Director for the Conservation Foundation. Jim works to preserve land as open space for the Conservation Foundation. In that duty, Jim works with government agencies and private landowners to negotiate open space purchases, facilitate land donations, and conservation easements. He lectures all over the region on local environmental issues and actively works with homeowners and business property owners to improve the environmental conditions of their sites. The Conservation at Home program was his idea, teaching about sustainable landscaping practices he currently manages the program. Jim attended St. Francis High School, Benedictine University, and then earned an MBA in marketing from the National University. Jim, I'm gonna try to give you uh, screen sharing permissions. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Um, can you actually screen, request a screen share and then I'll, yeah. Great, Great. thank you. Can you see everything good? Yep. All right. Well, um, I wanted to reach out and tell you how I think it's a beneficial thing to work with conservation uh, land trusts and not-for-profit conservation groups. There are a network of these. So if you're not in the Chicagoland region, um, I can help you with that at the end. I'll leave my email address. So there are this network of them in every state, every place. So you could partner up with them and it, it helps with grants. It helps with a lot of different things. And I think the main thing that we end up connecting with is through education. And that's my forte is sales and marketing. And the main, um, the main thing we're trying to sell is these conservation practices that Ryan talked about a little bit. Let's see if I can get this moving. Okay. Our main office is in Naperville on the McDonald farm, 60 acres protected. So we use it as a show site. We have solar panels, wind turbines, prairies, green roof, rain, different types of rainwater collection. We sell rain barrels and composters, those types of things. Bring people to our site and show them how nice conservation practices can be. In this book by Stephen Kellert, it isn't that I'm a nature guy or you're, you know, we have to connect with people because we're all nature people. We were born in a different situation than we are now. They we weren't living in high rises. And in this one picture, I'm hiking the Appalachian Trail or guided my son to his first big muskie. But if we're apart from the environment in which we evolved, we're not going to be healthy and happy. So getting back to why would people want to engage in these practices? Because it's better for everybody, not just people, but birds, butterflies, and the whole world. You know, as far as we all know, there is only one planet and we have not been taking care of it very well. So we get out to people's yards and I preach the eco-friendly story. Typically people know intrinsically that doing the chem lawn thing and pouring all this stuff is not the best thing for my for the birds and butterflies in my yard but i don't know where to start i wouldn't know where to begin and so we actually do the grassroots visiting of sites and do education i teach at the college level um, lecture across a wide variety of places so having the message come from a not-for-profit i have nothing to gain from it i'm not trying to sell you any concepts and the message gets delivered very easily from a not-for-profit. And having the stories, so we learn from stories. And in this case, these people removed acres and acres of buckthorn and honeysuckle. And when they did that, they earned their sign for their yard so they can show their neighbors what an open savanna looks like. And the trillium and bloodroot are starting to pop up in the woods. And I told uh, Carol that she needs to put up some bluebird houses. And she said, I've never seen a bluebird here, Jim. And I said, well, you never had an open savanna. And no more than I said that in comes the bluebird and they now have them nesting on their properties. So it's a lot of work to implement these programs, but telling people there is a payback is very important. So I start out with pretty simple things, you know, taking care of the water, 
functioning properties, wildlife attraction, less chemicals, less grass, healthy soil, more diverse trees and more oaks in general. And because the story is not, um, I'm not pushing a whole lot, um, people look at this and say, mm, I could do that. So it's a gentle nudge in the right direction. And because of what's been going on with the natural assets, people kind of understand that. This is a beautiful quote by Bromfield. And I think they're starting to come around. I mean, especially this time of year with Earth Day and Arbor Day, people are understanding that the earth is under siege and we've got to do what we can do, those small pieces of it as much as we can. So I bring that message to people that, you know, it isn't that complicated if you get back to the basics and that plants are the basic thing. So what plants we choose for our areas will make a difference, but plants are the life of this planet. This is a plant-based planet. So everything relies on plants to take the sunlight and turn it into food for everybody. So once we get the idea that plants are not just a decorative pretty thing, but they're actually functional and they're necessary for life, then it makes a difference what plants we've chosen. And these hummingbirds are just arriving now from the south and they can scan a property very quickly and say, nothing here for me. Um, if we want them, we have to create different habitats for them. And where it starts is in the root system. So we understand evolution in the animal world. We understand a giraffe has the long neck to eat the acacia leaves. We understand that turtles carry the shell around with them or that the wolf can run fast so it can catch the deer. But we don't see evolution in plants. And the plants, this is the Illinois is a prairie state. And these prairie plants have lived here for tens of thousands of years and been functional, absorbed water, and opened up the root systems and uh, cleared through the clay and created organic material in the soil so it made healthy soils. And then the subdivision era, we scraped off the topsoil and sold it all off. And people have their yards now in compacted clay and rock, very poor conditions. And we've got to get back to the way that it worked for all those years. And I sell the, the pretty. So um, typically people see these plants and, and I'm a marketing guy, so I'm selling them in full bloom at the beauty of it. I'll, I'll show you pictures of what we changed and it's trying to sell a concept and it, yeah, I do make it look as pretty as possible to illustrate the point. Front yard, these people have no grass but that's okay, that's what they want. And luckily we live in America, we can have things different ways. The park could be 80% native areas. And if, depending on, you know, if you have other areas for people to walk the dog and, and um, other play areas, having natural areas that are um, connected there are a big addition. We worked across the region with the different colors are different organizations that are running the program. The Conservation at Home program now has eight different organizations running it in, and we're in three states, uh, over 3000 properties that have been certified and thousands more that are working towards certification. And these people are wanting to buy plants, wanting to have maintenance in many cases and help so there's a lot of uh, misconception about how this native system is going to work. And so I think it's very important that I um, connect and try to further that education. We do non-residential sites also. We have uh, over 200 different sites and big name sites, hospitals, and um, this picture is from Shedd Aquarium, you name it. These concepts can be applied to any type of property, any size. I'm going to be certifying a ComEd site later this week. And park districts have a lot of land and much of it is not in ball fields. So they've been given properties that are either wetlands or creek areas um, besides where the ball fields are. And there was a mink that swam across this creek when I was on this bridge. A lot of the population now is not playing soccer. We're 
uh, walking with our grandkids or walking with the dog or our um, loved ones and having these manicured lawns are not going to bring wildlife, not going to bring us that relaxation that we're seeking when there's mowers running and all this chaos. We won't want to be connected to nature. This area in, it was in Naperville Park District and it was just a mud hole and they tried to mow it and it just bogged down the tractor. And why are we doing that? Why are we mowing these areas? This adds habitat. There's a place for little bunnies to hide in there. There's birds and butterflies that are gonna be utilizing this property and we reduce the amount of mowing. So, solving problems are what people want and that's what we can bring to them whether it's water poor soils more wildlife tree issues um, invasive species but um, there's very few people that are going to argue with i'll come and help you and oh by the way i don't charge this lady called and she said well i gotta show you where this pond is in the back of my yard when, when i went there it wasn't a pond, it was this dried, cracked clay. And bringing the story to them that we can solve the issue by adding organics. The, the grass has to be um, measured and planned in certain areas. And there's certain areas that should not be grass. And figuring out what goes where in the yard and how am I gonna amend the soils and make things better. Um, naturally and that doesn't mean rototilling in with a backhoe in there and, and working it to let the plants do the work birds are an easy thing for me to sell this is the 50 percent of the bird population was this these four top right bottom left are both invasive species and what people really want are our native birds the colorful birds and the ones that are finding their own food so this grouping will come to a bird feeder periodically and there are another group that will not come to a bird feeder including the little um, wren at the bottom we put out a wren house but we have no clue what they eat these birds are all eating bugs and the bugs are on the native plants so the plants bring the bugs the bugs bring the birds and if we want to have these in our yards and closer to us we have to have the proper habitat. So I bring that to people and very few people ask me, can you help me get more snakes or more bees? So, you know, knowing that the birds and the butterflies are going to be the selling objective um, makes it a lot easier for me to market and sell. You can grow your own bird food. So a lot of these plants I'm talking about, the native plants, will have food value for these birds. So I'm not telling to tell people that don't use a bird feeder, but you can also, especially in the summertime, supplement their food sources with not only the, the seeds that these plants bring, but also the native bugs that would be on the plants that they can feed from. And again, besides the birds, I sell butterflies and we build these butterfly gardens in, in parks and um, businesses because people just love butterflies. The bees come along for the ride under the radar and we build butterfly gardens or pollinator gardens because we don't want to talk about the bees. But unfortunately, it's the whole ecosystem that is suffering. But we just know that if we sell the butterflies, the rest will happen um, under the radar. It's pretty simple things, but they need food, they need water, they need a place to lay their eggs or make their nests. And it's not that difficult to put that together. I do a lot of education about what we've brought over. So the whole system of, you know, we, we're in zone five here, but that whole system was designed to find out if I can bring that plant from Florida up here. Um, but any plant that you're curious about is it connected to our environment just google where it came from lilacs on the bottom are a very good example they're very nice they have a nice smell but you'll never see bees pollinating the lilacs they just don't um, use those plants day lilies are another one 
roses, the list could go on and on, but these plants are not engaged into our ecosystem. So they're not functional, they're just purely decorative. If you wanna have a few decorative things around, but when we fill our whole yards full of non-functional plants, then our yards don't work. And I get called to come out and help me. So um, just like everything else, we have to create balance. So when people are looking at properties, they call me and they say, you know, can we do anything with this? Well, this is Death Valley. This is terrible. So anything I would do for this is going to be better. And maybe I don't tell them how it's going to look. Just let's, let's work on this together. And we have contractors that would get in and do some of these projects. And you can make somebody a hero by taking bad and making it better. This was uh, in downtown Naperville. And then what would we do on residential landscapes? So these people call, they have water problems on the sidewalk. They've got no birds, no butterflies. They have to put salt to break up the ice in the winter from the water issues and the salt kills the grass. And what would they do to make this a more eco-friendly landscape? Notice the big arborvita overgrown. Look at the beautiful brickwork, stone, and water issues are taken care of by running the water away from the sidewalk, lowering an area, creating a place for the water to pool over here, putting in the native plantings, uh, a defined edge for the grass, so less grass, maintaining the grass in the right way, and win-win situation as far as curb appeal, uh, creating habitats, um, all taken care of. We've done bad things with the open space, these ponds with eroded shorelines. This isn't a nice place for me to have a picnic with my kids or grandchildren. So why are we doing this over and over again where we're creating habitat for geese? And what we want to do is a diverse landscape that's gonna be deep rooted and not eroding away into something that is colorful. The geese are gone, they will not walk through the native landscaping, you're gonna have herons and egrets, no geese. And I have to sell this to the homeowners there saying that this is a better way to go. So Ryan talked a little bit about grass. I do the same thing, harp about why are we doing this? I used to sell fertilizer and the nitrogen levels on a bag of Scots or other fertilizers is super high. And it's not the way we wanna be putting the fertilizer on our yards. We don't even know what it needs and yet we've been told feed it and clover is a great idea i think creating um i would be the first one to want to plant these grass areas and show them what the clover can look like uh, mixed with grass uh, cutting your uh, mowing regiment and fixing nitrogen in the soil they have all this talk right now about no mow till Mother's Day or no mow May. And it's lost on me because many of the lawns I go to don't have any clover or violets or other native plants um, or any flowering plants for the bees to feed on. So it doesn't help if you're using Chemlawn or one of those uh, synthetic fertilizer companies because you won't have any broadleaf flowers in the lawn anyway. So we try to bring people information about, you know, testing your soil and putting the organics back in again and aeration and um, low nitrogen organic is the way to go on the lawn where you're going to have lawn. And we're covering the United States with lawn. So I tell people like you need as much, even if you're not ready to give up your lawn, which many of us are not going to have zero lawn. Let's think about reduction of lawn when it is the largest crop in 39 of the lower 48 states and in Illinois where I am there's more grass than corn and soybeans together and it's a non-productive source it's biologically dead it's covering 20 million acres across the United States very costly and why so I bring people pictures you know left or right which one's prettier which one looks burned out in a drought and the other one is blooming 
that orange is milkweed. So we all have heard about the milkweed and the monarchs. Well, this milkweed is short and pretty and it's not as gawky as the natural, the uh, common milkweed. So, you know, would this be a problem to have low profile landscapes that are blooming and pretty instead of all this turf? We created a program to promote what I'm calling a, a pollinator meadow. So the idea of a prairie did not go well on college campuses and areas. So this meadow concept is a shorter native landscaping area. And we implemented it at our farm. So ours is 25 feet wide and 1400 lineal feet along a regional bike trail. And we sold this concept to the tollway authority and I'm working with the corridor group to bring it to ComEd sites and NICOR and pipeline and a variety of other um, highway type situations because the maintenance is somewhere in the range of 50% less costly than weekly mowing. So whether it be the grass or the trees, we promote a variety of different types of trees reduction of the ones in our area we are overloaded with maple and honey locust we were overloaded in elm and ash in the past and those got wiped out and we're trying to bring that information out to people that we need to diversify and that things like bradford pear will be in the bottom um, the third category soon when it is deemed an invasive species so we've been planting the wrong things and doing things the wrong way with the trees we have. So these white pines would be much better off if they did not have turf underneath them. And bringing that information to people that if you got rid of the turf, look at the wildflowers that could be right now, the Virginia bluebells, um, looking at woodland flocks and Solomon seal, Carex species, sedges, there's a lot of beautiful woodland plants that we could grow in these shade areas and not be running lawn equipment over the tops of the roots and compacting the soil even more in our woodland areas. The runoff is another issue. We talk about water issues and how now the pipes with the pollution are, have been taken away. And so the number one source of pollution entering our water systems is from across the grass, across the soil, across the uh, parking areas and roads and it water carries a lot of that pollution with it and some of the solutions could be rain gardens rain barrels and these bio swales along roadways like this one here a more lineal rain garden is called a bio swale so how would we bring those applications to people so here my boss and i are creating a rain garden at the farm for people to see we show them how you put a rubber mat these stones behind me are gonna be on the rubber mat to slow the water coming in. Notice these air conditioner units will be hidden by these viburnum shrubs and we don't have to mow it. The purple is spiderwort and the white is penstemon digitalis, the heart medicine. These grasses on the dry edge are prairie drop seed. So having people visualize what what these things could look like and how they might implement them in their yard and bring that to them is what we sell. And we need partners, we need um, park districts and businesses and individual homeowners to show these concepts in a positive manner. And um, that's how it helps me. So my information is here, my email and office number so if there's any way I can help you or take questions now, uh, a few short questions, and then um, certainly email me if you have deeper questions or issues. We do certify properties. So if you have been doing the good things, um, we can work on you with certification. We're doing the ComEd one is gonna have a photo opportunity where we're gonna take pictures and put it in the paper and on Facebook and social media, because when people are doing a good thing, I wanna promote it. Thanks, Jim. I'm seeing if we have any questions right now. 
Uh, we have five minutes for questions for Jim before we turn it over to Mackenzie. We will have a Q and A session um, at the end of this session too. So um, if you don't have any questions, we can just circle back uh, later. Let's see. Um, we have a question. What does it mean to get a property certified through conservation at home, Jim? Okay. Um, people, we have a, if you go on our website, theconservationfoundation.org, there is a checklist there. And on the checklist, we're asking people to reduce the amount of grass, to have a native component uh, in their yards, to um, be aware of the water flow and do what they can to reduce the amount of runoff leaving the property. So there's a handful of things that we're asking people to do. And if they do those, they can get the property um, designated and certified. We have a mapping program so you can get your property put on the map. And the idea, each person that gets certified gets some brochures. So they talk to their neighbors and it becomes a grassroots movement or whole neighborhoods are trying. Um, I did a program in Wheaton and the garden club had uh, 14 garden club members that were interested in going more native. And uh, I went out and visited those garden clubs and from the ones that are doing the right things, you know, one leads to another and then we can get whole areas that are certified. One subdivision in uh, Moni the developer put all the homes in the conservation at home program and used all native landscaping uh, around the, all the common area was um, naturalized. And they had me do education to the homeowners about naturalized landscaping. And you might see a skunk more often, or you'll have opportunity to see much more uh, bird life in the subdivision than you would have prior and how that works and why you'd want to be closer to nature than the typical subdivision. 